So this video will review, um, as part of our cell processes unit, uh, the discussion we had in class about the nature of light, which relates to this process right here, photosynthesis. So in order to understand photosynthesis, you need to know a little bit about, more about the nature of light. So here's two of the sun. Um, the first question we discussed in class is what is light exactly? Well, it's kind of interesting to think about it. Light is not matter. We learned matter is anything that has mass and takes up space, and light doesn't have any of those or either of those characteristics. Light is its own unique type of material, which is energy. So basically the universe is made up of two things, matter and energy, and light is one type of energy. Um, and if you're more interested to find out about this, we went over this in class, you don't have to know it for the test, but it turns out that when I just said that the universe is made out of matter and energy, I was really maybe only talking about 4% of what the universe is made out of, but this is not something that you actually have to know for the test, so I'm not going to review it. Um, so another characteristic of light, sorry you can't see this part right here, is that it moves in waves, kind of like the arms on this cartoon character. Instead of light just traveling from one point to another point in a straight line, it actually moves in an up and down pattern that they call waves. And white, uh, light actually has uh, kind of a physical property or a particle of light has a special name. It's called a photon. Like this laser pointer that I'm moving around as I talk here, if this was one particle of light moving in a wave-like pattern, we would refer to it as a photon. There's no atoms in light. Um, now, light's made in two different ways that you have to know. One is called nuclear fusion reactions. That's what happens in the sun. And the other is by electron excitation, which we'll cover in just a minute. So first, nuclear fusion reactions are what are demonstrated in this picture. As we learned in our last unit, um, fusion inside of the sun actually creates new elements in the periodic table. Most suns are a combination largely of of helium, which these are two ices, I just said that wrong, um, largely of hydrogen. These are two isotopes of hydrogen here. Um, and when in the, the gravitational force and the, the kinetic energy of the sun, the heat energy of the sun, pushes these guys really close, fusing them, two hydrogen atoms can actually make another type of atom. In this case, it's making helium. We learned how this fusion process actually makes the first 25 elements in the periodic table. Well, the thing that we didn't discuss when we were learning about that is the fusion process when two atoms get fused together also generates or creates the light energy we see coming out of the sun. So that's called a nuclear fusion reaction, one of the ways light is made from atoms getting fused or squished together inside of the sun. When that happens, a reaction happens that releases light energy. The other way light is made, um, this happens in lots of different ways, is called electron excitation. So in this case, you have to imagine atoms of some material. Um, in this case, it could be atoms of a light bulb. And if we have, let's say instead of a photon of light at the beginning of this, let's just say this is the electrical wire coming into a light bulb. And what the electrical wire carries is electrons. And as the electrons pass by the atoms inside of the light bulb, so they're supposed to be the nucleus of the atom and one of the electrons, the electrons that pass by kind of bump into, let's say, or essentially transfer their energy to this electron right here from the wire. And this electron, when it absorbs that energy, it can actually jump out to an outer orbital, storing that energy temporarily. But this position for that electron isn't natural and it's not stable. So what happens is it quickly bounces back down, which is what's supposed to have happened here. And when it bounces back down, it can release energy, light energy in the form of a photon. That's called electron excitation again, because when an atom's electrons, so this is an atom, that's the electrons, happen to absorb energy, in the case I just talked about would be from electricity in a wire, absorbing energy causes it to move to an outer orbital, and when they fall back down, because that outer orbital is not stable, they give off the light energy. That's the electrons we say are excited when they have absorbed, the, absorbed that energy, and then when they release it, the light comes off. Um, you can also have this with different types of light. You can have UV light hitting an atom, um, and you know, on say an article of fluorescent clothing, and those electrons there can actually absorb that UV light energy, transferring or temporarily absorbing it, and then when they fall back down, that release that UV light, which we normally can't see UV light, in another wavelength of color, say yellow, fluorescent yellow coming off there. 
So um, in light bulbs um, and LCD projectors, in this screen you're staring at right now, the light is coming off of it mainly because electricity is hitting electrons, causing them to be energized, and when they fall back, they give off the light that we see, and that's called electron excitation. Moving on. Uh, light from the sun isn't just in the area, the range of energy we call visible light. Light from the sun includes all of these different wavelengths of light. It's all moving like I described before, the energies. And the closer the wavelengths are together, the actual more energy they have. Gamma rays, X-rays, and ultraviolet rays are rays that actually can go in and break apart and damage your molecules. Um, on the other end, radio waves, really long wavelengths, um, don't do that at all. They travel through the air, but they don't damage living things. Our eyes have the ability to detect wavelengths in this range of size of wavelengths. Together, all of these um, different ranges of wavelengths that can be produced by the sun, and in a lot of cases, man can produce these. As together, they're called the electromagnetic spectrum. Spectrum kind of means range of energy. Um, and light is kind of an electromagnetic process. So as it says here, light is one type of energy in the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, we went into a little bit more detail in this in class. But for the most part, you just have to know that light um, that we see that plants use for photosynthesis is in the visible light range um, of the electromagnetic spectrum. And there are other ranges of electromagnetic spectrum that we commonly hear about in our everyday Next step in uh, this discussion was about uh, pigments and what are they? Um, and they're more than just two words kind of shoved together. I guess mint isn't spelled exactly right. But by definition, um, a pigment is a colored molecule, but more scientifically important than that, a pigment is a molecule that can absorb specific wavelengths of light energy. So thinking of the discussion of the electromagnetic spectrum from the last page, um, these colored sand molecules here, let's say this blue right here, has molecules in it that when the sunlight energy hits it, all the colors of the rainbow, the molecule inside of there absorbs everything but blue. Blue is bouncing off and hitting you in the eye. That's why you see it as red. This pigment back here is absorbing everything but red. This pigment's absorbing everything but yellow. So a pigment is a molecule that absorbs specific wavelengths of light. And really, we should add, the wavelengths they don't absorb bounces off and hits you in the eye. And that's what you actually see. So why is this important? Well, in plants, they have the pigment um, that we know called chlorophyll. This is the shape of the molecule of chlorophyll. And chlorophyll, this molecule in this area, has the ability to absorb wavelengths of light. That's why we say it's a chlorophyll is a pigment molecule. Um, and as you probably have guessed, is when inside of a chloroplast is what this drawing is supposed to show. The green area is where the chlorophyll is. When sunlight hits it, the chlorophyll has the ability to absorb most colors except for green. Green bounces off or green passes through, which is why when we look in the direction of a plant, we see green because that's the color that's not being absorbed. The red, the violets, and the blue, especially a little bit of the yellow, is being absorbed by the plant, and so we don't see that part. Um, so if you get specifically, well, how much of each of the different colors of light do plants absorb? You get this chart right here, which is called the absorption spectrum for a for chlorophyll, actually, there's a couple kinds of chlorophyll, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and some other pigments that are involved in photosynthesis. But together, overall, if you look at the trend overall, you see that there's a few areas that chlorophyll absorbs a lot of the light in the ultra, uh, not ultraviolet, in violet, and the blue area, and kind of the, the reddish orangish area. It doesn't absorb the, the peaks, or there aren't any peaks around green, a tiny bit in yellow. And so that means this part's reflected, and that's why plants are green. So if you were to kind of fill in this chart as far as what colors does chlorophyll absorb the best, this should be really red, blue, maybe blue-violet. And what does it absorb the least? Green, mainly green, but also yellow. 